Hey folks, I'm going to be talking about how being a generalist can help you become a better specialist. Uh, let's see if this works. So the aims of this talk are to define the distinction between generalists and specialists, um, which some of you may know or may not know what, what that means exactly, but we're going to sort of like uh, get those uh, de definitions out of the way. Uh, we're going to destigmatize the jack of all trades saying that we all like know and hate probably. And if you don't, then I'll give you a bit of background to that. It's a bit of a history lesson, but also, you know, sort of context. Um, and then I'm going to be demonstrating examples and benefits of being a generalist through the lens of a video game sound designer. Now, I know that not everyone here is a sound designer, but I would say that probably the vast majority of people on Air Wiggles um, probably focuses on sound design. Um, but by no means is this talk like specific to uh, like sound designers talk about like composers and technical sound designers and uh, you know, VR, VO artists, like it's all, it's all kind of relevant, but because of my background as a sound designer, it's just easier to sort of like talk through that perspective. And then because I'm an evil bastard, I'm going to give you some homework as well. And uh, yeah, but it'll be good. It will help. It's like the doctor giving you painful, like uh, rehab to, or physio to, to sort of like help heal a wound. So, uh, so yeah, like I said, for anyone who kind of like uh, came in, um, like a little bit later, save your questions until after because uh, because there will be a section at the end. So some definitions. Uh, we've got a generalist, a person competent in several different fields or activities versus a specialist, a person highly skilled in a specific and restricted field. Should be pretty evident what the difference is there, but for uh, for anyone who wants to be really specific, while a specialist systematically hones skills related to their domain, a generalist seeks to sharpen a wide range of related skills that will prove useful in multiple domains. I mean, this is like the the dictionary definition of, of like the difference between a generalist and a specialist. And one of the key points here is, is like, uh, a, a wide range of skills to be useful in multiple domains. So already it's sort of like this modernized idea of that, like, like generalists aren't so bad, right? Um, so uh, here we have our, uh, our wonderful quote, a jack of all trades is a master of none. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this before and uh, mostly not in a good way. Um, so yeah, it describes a person whose knowledge while covering a number of areas is superficial in all of them. Essentially someone who has uh, spread themselves too thin and, uh, and you know, they haven't focused enough time to be able to be good at anything. I'd say it's probably a very like, like uh, broad, like just offhanded comment that you can like make without knowing any context of of someone's skills and it's it's sort of you know we're, we're a nice community we want to be nice to people so like yeah um the saying dates back to the 1700s and is mostly used in a negative way and has done since then um it's also mistakenly thought to have been coined by a man named robert green who i think was a critic uh, when he was, um, yeah, when he was talking about a young Shakespeare who was like performing and writing his plays and just being like, uh, you know, that's ridiculous. Like, you know, you can't be good at both of these things. You're never going to get anywhere. But actually, the the phrase that he used, I have it here, is uh, he used the phrase "absolute Johann Fechtotum," which essentially means the same thing as far as I'm aware, but it's just not the same words. Uh, so yeah, so the actual phrase, the, the sort of quote comes from the 1700s. However, throughout history, uh, and you know, throughout the world, this is a saying that's been quite universal by, by, you know, like many cultures. So the Chinese say equipped with knives all over yet none is sharp. Uh, in Estonia, they say nine trades, the 10th one hunger for obvious reasons, spread yourself too thin. You don't eat. And my favorite, uh, in Hungary, they say you can't ride two horses at the same time since you only have one ass, uh, which again, just beautiful, beautiful uh, imagery. So as uh, Adam very correctly said, um, a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. You might have heard this as well, probably less common, but far more flattering. Um, yeah, so it's it's a modern extension that sort of appeared sometime in the 21st century. It wasn't obvious when I was doing my research, but uh, it appeared sometime. I think that this is a sort of indication of like 
modernization of of sayings is that you know that that like what 300 years of uh of like being a jack of all trades wasn't a good thing but like i wouldn't necessarily say that that's the case nowadays hence why i'm doing a talk about generalism right um so yeah uh apprenticeships family businesses and let's face it job security are like less common nowadays um if you've worked in the games industry for a while i'm sure you've seen a lot of posts about people losing their jobs suddenly um but the point is that like you know like like jobs require extremely wide skill sets so like uh you know it, whereas in the past you know you're the son of a blacksmith and like you're always going to be a blacksmith uh and uh you know you're you're going to go into the family business and if you're not the best blacksmith that you know like in the town then you're you're probably going to lose it to some other good blacksmith who's going to like come along so you kind of have to be like really focused in that whereas like nowadays i mean there are blacksmiths who exist but i would probably argue that like they are themselves generalists because they probably have to like have social media and they they probably have to you know like do networking of some kind and they need to sort of like deal with suppliers and like where you know like you you get the picture like like it's not just as clear cut probably in the past it's not that clear cut either but like we we live in a different age now and the last point is that information education opportunities are much more widely like available for us um so i'll get onto this point a little bit just down the line but uh uh you know like it's it's easier than ever to learn i mean even with like improvements or, or in ai like chat gpt and stuff like that i know people who are like i suddenly know how to like a, a script in reaper or like i'm making my own games because like i'm getting help from ai and stuff like you know or uh youtube is the probably the best uh, resource that we have and uh it's filled with cat videos so <laughs> that's a thing but um but you know we're we're able to uh like learn anything we have sort of like the 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 uh, accumulative wealth of human knowledge at our fingertips um so we just need you know other things that are quite hard like willpower and and sort of motivation and stuff like that so uh some of you who know me i've waited a little bit uh longer to um to introduce myself uh you know me as a, a nintendo slut and i love uh nintendo transitions so i'm just going to do a bunch of nintendo transitions like nintendo direct i'm obliged uh by the slides to wave to the audience and i can only assume that you're going to wave back uh maybe just type wave uh who knows but anyway there's a point to this uh i'm john kelleher and uh yeah let's dig into it so I'm a senior sound designer at No Breaks Games, working on Human Fall Flat, which I can now say as of yesterday. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm the sole audio designer in the like in the company. I manage the whole. Uh, oh, bless you guys, waving. Um, I manage the whole sort of audio pipeline, and uh, you know we are hiring for an audio designer uh, as of you know uh, this month. So hopefully we'll be managing a team at some point as well. Um, I'm a self-taught sound designer, game designer, and programmer. So in previous jobs that I've worked on at a company called Supergonk and a bunch of freelance work that I've done before, I, um, you know, a lot of my role was was more than just managing an entire like audio pipeline, but like it, it was uh, sort of, you know, like programming an equivalent of uh, of FMOD, but using, you know, just stock Unity audio and, and um, yeah, and and sort of like, uh, I kind of got funneled, pigeonholed into uh, sort of a programmer role with like uh, his sound design and music as a treat, um, making like game mechanics and UI and all sorts of stuff. And then I basically made like every level in the game in a game called Warp Drive, um, you know, d designing gameplay and all that sort of stuff. So, so <laughs> you, you kind of get the picture is that uh, it's it's I'm, uh, I've been spread quite thin. So you know, working. Uh, at no breaks, despite being quite daunting, is actually um, uh, a real relief for me uh, compared to you know like doing three jobs at the same time. Uh, if you've been wondering where the accent's from, I'm half Swedish, half Irish, born in France, raised in Spain, live in the UK. It's a mouthful. I've practiced it since I was born. Um, uh, if you think that you called it before, you're you're only lying to yourself. Um, <laughs> Uh, I speak two and a half languages naturally. Uh, having grown up in Spain, I speak Spanish. Obviously, I speak English, and I can speak babies Swedish, uh, which I won't embarrass myself on a recorded stream. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I've I've worked in pubs, uh, many <laughs> many jobs that I'm sure everyone relates to aren't great. I've managed a co-working space, like office space for like a like sort of like an incubator hub in Guildford. Um, I managed that for a while. Uh, I've worked in a music shop. I've taught music, and most importantly, I worked in a burrito shop, uh, which you know, like uh, it it was its own kettle of fish. Um, but ultimately, it's what pushed me over the edge to finally pursue a full time career <laughs> in sound. And I'm sure a lot of you can relate to, you know, that job that's just like, oh, my God, I can't hack this anymore. I need to have like a, a career that's actually fun, regardless of whether it pays or not. I actually uh, uh, saved up like two grand, I think, uh, and then just kind of like quit my job and uh, just jumped into the world of freelancing, um, which was, yeah, probably a story for the pub. But um yeah, it was good. So uh, I have way too many hobbies. I play games, read fantasy, hike, travel the world, love cooking, go climbing because I'm a basic game dev man. Uh, say hi to people on the street. I listen to old fishermen on walks in Brecon. That one's for my girlfriend, but you can ask me about that in the pub as well. Um, I love all music, all art, all cultures, all people. These things give me life and they are what make me who I am. Uh, ultimately, I'm a generalist in all aspects of life, both personal and in my career, and it serves me and many others very well. However, uh, it has also been a point of, you know, anxiety uh, and a point of sort of like self-doubt that's really crippled me. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I think we've all probably been affected by this, um, like, you know, uh, where do I focus my efforts? I guess I'll just focus my efforts on anything and everything. And just, you, you know, you've, you've probably also heard the, the term like, like adding strings to your bow. Um, I think that's probably like more of a like positive way of thinking about it is sort of like adding, you know, adding more strings to your bow. Anyway, I digress. Um, yes. So <laughs> I hope you've appreciated the pictures of me just being a kid and stuff like that. I, I didn't really know what to put there. So, so hey, it's me as Spider-Man. So just like Spider-Man, who juggles being a superhero, high school student and a uh, scientist, we can also be heroic generalists. Nintendo transition. Um, yeah, so if we take a look at like the skill set of a modern sound designer, we'll see a bunch of skills. Sorry, I'm going to take a sip of herbal tea. Right, okay. So we'll see a bunch of skills like computer skills, creative skills, recording, editing, mixing, video editing, website design. If you're doing portfolios and stuff like that, you'll know that you have to like learn a bunch of skills. Like I said before, a blacksmith wouldn't have had to like design their own website in the like, like, uh, I don't know, 1200s or something. Um, and time management and communication, like all of these things, if you're a professional sound designer, you will have these skills or, you know, even an aspiring sound designer or whatever. Um, uh, uh, we can take a look at like a modern game developer skill set as well and sort of compare and contrast the, uh, the skill set that you might need. So again, we're seeing like computer skills, time management skills, spreadsheets, communication, game engine knowledge, version control. If you don't know what that is, look up uh, like Perforce, SDN or Git. Um, basic to intermediate uh, logic and problem solving skills is you know, you wouldn't think that that's a skill, but it is, you know, like you, you got to know how to uh, how to solve things. So anyway, I could probably argue that some of these would go in the sound designer skill set. And just on cue, here is a Venn diagram that everyone knows and loves as well, uh, has been really popular this week in people's talks, and I love it. Um, so here are the skills that I just mentioned before, sort of overlapping. And, um, and we can see that actually a bunch of these skills are... Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of crossover between these two disciplines. Um, obviously, I've been selective here to kind of like prove my point, but um, but you'll see that like like if you know by being either one of these things, you're already more of a generalist than you think you might be. And if other fields of expertise are also have overlapping skills with like you know with the ones that you already know, then it mightn't be so hard to learn new skills as you first think. Which brings us to uh how can being a generalist help you become a better specialist or rather this is probably a more digestible way of thinking about it how can a diverse skill set and external experiences 
feed back into your specialized field. So we're talking about this idea of uh, of you know like like specialist versus uh, uh, generalist, but like I, I don't really think that we we should be thinking about it like that clear cut or that black and white. Um, so let's think about it in terms of skill sets. So imagine how learning these skills could feed back into your craft. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a couple of like well I say a couple I'm going to talk about like five adjacent skills. Uh, and then uh, a few more like un unrelated skills to sort of your craft of being a sound designer. So um, I know that there are a bunch of people, some uh, mentees of mine as well, who are like, like, I'm just an asset creator sound designer. So let's look at it from that approach. Learning technical sound design can help like understanding how your sounds can be implemented. And it can even help implementing like, by implementing them yourself you can uh, like, it can steer the way that you actually design the sounds yourself. So I have a perfect example of this when I was chatting to Greg, he's not necessarily a technical sound designer, but like, like he has technical sound design skills um, and, and he's bloody good at it as well, I should mention. Um, but an example of this is, you know, if you're a sound designer and you're creating looping sounds, uh, an example that I had the other day was like fire sounds, uh, like fire loops just happening in a level, you know, um, if you have like five of these like torches next to you and they're all playing the same loop, you can do a bunch of things uh, with that as a technical sound designer as just like one fire loop where, you know, you can sort of like offset the start, uh, the start position of like the, the play cursor and, and uh, stuff like that. However, if you end up in a situation where these sounds end up playing on top of each other, you're going to have one of two things, which is you're either going to have uh, the sounds playing at, you know, the, the, the volume multiplying, because that's just what you're doing. Um, or you're going to have them slightly offset, which will create phasing. And, uh, you know, that's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty ugly sound. So, um, yeah, so a, a tip that he taught me, um, which is, yeah, like uh, really interesting is, uh, sort of chopping up this loop into a bunch of little grains and then whacking them into your uh, into your middleware like Y's and F mod and setting up sort of looping containers where there's a crossfade between each sample. And then what you get is even if there are two samples playing on top of each other, the next random sample is just gonna like uh, is just gonna like stop that like so weird artifacts. And these are things that you would learn like chatting to technical sound designers and uh you know uh or, or learning these skills yourself but ultimately how do we learn we watch them from youtube or or we chat to technical sound designers so anyway um if we do the same thing with programming uh you know programming skills can enable faster iteration on technical sounds you know actually implementing your your stuff from uh from your middleware into the game engine uh so yeah so implementation as well sort of under you know the, these uh, logic and problem solving skills uh, and also integration with game mechanics as well you know so sort of like whether it's hooking up with animations or or whether it's like actually getting stuff uh firing from uh from the code base or you know using visual scripting like it all counts as programming um game design understanding game uh can help you with understanding game designers creations faster and help you make sounds that cover all possible audio cases animation and vfx both of these fields are actually very like similar and adjacent to sound, you know, so um, uh, they're, they're all really closely linked. So learning from animations and animators can offer a lot of insight and inspiration for your sound. Uh, you can learn so much from watching cartoons, stop motion and anime. There's a perfect example of uh, Juan Pablo Uribe, where he was talking about this like animation curve, which is essentially just, you know, if you, if you take that an animation curve and turn it like into an amplitude, uh like a curve or something like that that they, they all overlap and they're all skills that are great but this curve that he was talking about was um this idea of how to get like punchy impacts where there's like a uh sort of like a rise and then a big dip to silence and then like a bigger transient that sort of uh you you've all heard it that like it feels a lot more like like powerful than shapu right uh that was really bad Anyway, yeah, so so there's a lot that you can learn from sort of like animators and uh, things outside of sound. 
And uh, the last one I have here is speaking other disciplines languages, which is arguably more important than probably any of these things. Um, I find the audio regularly highlights like broken designs and code. So being able to speak with coders and designers in their language helps speed up the process of communicating what's wrong and fixing it. It's, it's a lot easier for me to, uh, to be able to, um, you know, communicate with someone like that. And I have an example of this as well that I'm sure a lot of you have probably experienced it, especially if you've come from a music background, is that the less clients know about your field, the more words they're going to start using that really don't apply to, to any knowledge that you have. I had this client once who I was doing uh, some music for, and he came back to me with, um, uh, I don't really like it. It needs to sound more purple. And like that, it was like a knife, like twisting in my heart. That was just like, what the flip do you mean, man? Uh, and he was just like, oh, I don't know, man, like more purple. <laughs> yeah. So if he'd turned around and said, oh, I don't know, the violas sound a little bit too muddy or they're like clashing with the trombone range or, or, you know, there's, it's, it's like a little bit too uh, sharp and in, in like, like in the high end, whatever that means. Uh, it would have helped me like a lot more than just saying something's purple. So, you know, getting a vocabulary and sort of like experience chatting to other people in other disciplines is so important. It's really good that everyone's coming here to Air Wiggles and sort of like like interacting with this community and chatting to each other. But uh, like when you go to game events or networking, uh, you know, like developed coming up and that, uh, uh, you know, like chat to as many programmers as you can, chat to as many, you know, like artists as you can, stuff like that. Like we all have stuff to share with uh, with one another. So let's look at some unrelated skills. Uh, I'll, I'll try and blast through these a little bit faster because I'm waffling. Uh, yeah, one second. Uh, so yeah, uh, everyone's going to love this one. Playing games can actually help you make games. What a surprise. Um, but playing games analytically can help you develop a mental library and literacy of successful and unsuccessful examples to draw from. I mean, like, like playing games is great, but like, uh, but playing games and sort of like, like stopping, looking, analyzing, like, like, how does this game do something really good? What do I like about it? And what do I hate about it? And, uh, and you know, like it, it can really help you. It certainly helped me be like, uh, oh no, this mechanic just isn't going to work. Look at this game that does it really poorly and it really like negatively impacts the, the, uh, the experience. And then, you know, whoever the director just doesn't listen to you. And then they're like, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, but anyway, at least you have that. And at least you can give them your professional opinion. Um, cooking is a perfect example. It's, full of amazing life skills and lessons. It's part of our culture as, as a species. Um, through cooking, I learned that I generally need to go harder with spices and, uh, uh, you know, as much as I need to go hard with, like, harder with plugins. So, uh, you know, like, um, I think it's very easy to kind of, like, with, with cooking, you can't really take stuff back. Like, uh, you know, you oversalt something. Sometimes you can put honey in it, but, you know, you, you kind of can't do that. But with sound design, you know, you can go ham and then just sort of like delete all of your plugins and go, you know, like, oh, right. Actually, you know, it was fine before I put uh, anything on it. So it makes it like a nice playground to be able to do it. But like cooking is one of those things that I think is wonderful. And even if you make a mistake, you just get better and learn uh, next time. So highly recommend it. Um, Learning from people, places, and cultures. I mean, I can't like overstate how important this is just as being a human. I know we're talking about like sound design here, but being a human is, is these, these are really important experiences and skills to have. Um, so these things help draw from a wealth of unique experiences, you know, your unique experiences dealing, uh, uh, interacting with these people, places, and cultures. Um, you know, and not only like all across the world, but throughout history as well. And it will inevitably add a sense of artistic identity and character into your work because these experiences, whether we like it or not, bleed into our work. But more so now than ever, I think it's like really important uh, to have a cultural, uh, like a cultural sensitivity and like historical accuracy. I think, you know, there are a bunch of games that are uh, like we will uh, make sure that everything sounds like it did in the, the I don't know, 800s or whatever. Who knows? Um, but these things are really important. And then people skills and communication. Like I know I was talking about like chatting to your peers, but also chatting to, uh, uh, you know, like, like, 
uh, your friends properly and your peers properly and your your uh you know how to talk to a, uh, someone in a lower sort of uh, hierarchical structure to you and likewise being able to talk to your directors uh and uh, or people you're leading or your leads and stuff like that so really really important and i've saved the best for last because i think that this is really really important is getting therapy <laughs> um yeah, there's a disclaimer at the bottom that says, obviously, if you're fortunate enough to have the money or live in a country that provides this through national health care. But I think that this is anecdotal and anecdotal through friends, like secondhand anecdotes, is that genuinely this was the best thing I could have ever done with my life. I went through a lot of like like trauma that I didn't even know that I went through. And like like as much as it helped me in my personal life, it also helped me in my career in ways that I never really expected it to. You can help yourself so that you help others around you with love and empathy. I'm just going to let that sit there for a moment while I take a sip, but it's important. Nintendo Translation. So uh, I've, I'm going to move on a little bit with some more sort of educational stuff. But one of our very own air wigglers, uh, Nathan Moody, is uh, is just full of wisdom. But one of the things that he said on a, a post that I made on Air Wiggles a little while ago, he said, it's good to adopt a comb shaped knowledge of as much as you can. And it's okay if some teeth on your comb go deeper than others. He then further goes on about uh, this idea of uh, T-shaped learning, which uh, I'd, you know, it was introduced to me then. And then I started like <laughs> looking up a bunch of like dry business, agile and like recruitment articles and sort of like almost bored myself to death. It was painful. However, this nugget of wisdom came out of it. And this it, like perfectly encapsulate this idea of, um, you know, being what's called a generalized specialist. Um, the, the T is representative of sort of your skill set. So the top part is learning across a breadth of skills and areas. And the bottom part is focusing in a few specific areas to gain depth of knowledge and expertise. Uh, I think I have it written probably a little bit like more concisely here, but it says it shows general, uh, shallow knowledge of a wide array of fields, but deep knowledge of a few. So, yeah, so it's this idea is that you don't have to be perfect at everything. Like, like maybe if you're trying to sort of like equally spread your um, your workload on on being like a sound designer and a programmer and a, a housewife or something like that, although you should probably, I, I don't know, whatever, bad example. Um, like house husband. There we go. It's 2023. Uh, I'm so down for that. Yeah. So, um Ah, oh, I've, I've lost it now. But yeah, the, the point is that you sort of focus in the things that you want to and all of these other things sort of like funnel and supplement. Uh, I don't know if you see me going like towards the camera, like funnel and supplement uh, down so that the, the skills that you're sort of focused on are, uh, are you know, the, the skills that you are specialized in and the other things are kind of, you know, all, um, yeah they're uh, they're all there to, to kind of like help enrich your life and hopefully other people's. Nintendo transition. Um, a question that I got asked by someone uh, recently on Airwiggles was, how do you market yourself as a generalist? And it's a really good question because until recently, I, I didn't really know. I kind of learned through making mistakes and, uh, you know, like everything, uh, like everything in life, you kind of, uh, you learn. And then uh, I'm in a privileged position to be able to sort of like spread that knowledge. So as I said before, there's this idea of a generalized specialist. That is what you are. You are not a jack of all trades. You are not something, you know, like uh, something else that's quite like self-deprecating. You are a generalized specialist. You have a broad skill set that you are specialized in. And you need to market these skills in order of relevance to your employer's needs or potential employer's needs. So, for example, if you are applying for a sound design role, I don't think I need to say it, but sometimes you do. Market your sound design skills first and nice to haves later. Um, you know, you are applying for a sound design role. You'd think that that would make sense. Anyway, whatever. Um, and then work on an ele elevator pitch that flows like butter. There's a very UK centric joke in the bottom corner. But I think it's Akash Thakar who talks about the elevator pitch in some of his old talks. I think it might have been his TED talk or something. But he talks about, you know, like, practice your elevator pitch to death like like don't fumble while you're trying to like like sell your services to someone or market your services to someone like you know it it's uh it's not as daunting as you might think essentially 
So we'll take some examples. Uh, instead of saying this uh, when applying for a sound designer role, it might look a little bit familiar to some people and it might hurt. I have done this and I have failed doing this. Um, I'm a composer sound designer uh, or a composer slash sound designer who has experience in film, TV and games, audio middleware such as Wise and FMOD, game engines including Unity, Unreal Engine, Godot and every DAW under the sun. Sound familiar? Yeah, probably, because it's pretty much what every like job application sort of comes through. And if we analyze it a little bit closer, the, the things that stand out to me are uh, you're a composer applying for a sound designer role. Um, mm, yeah, I sort of like like my eyebrows raise. Um, so who has experience in film, TV and games? Cool. Prove it. <laughs> you know, tell me what games you've worked on. Tell me what TV shows you've worked on. Tell me what games you've worked on. But, you know, also at the same time, it's like, like, are you applying for a game studio? If so, who has experience in games on what consoles, on what platforms? Like, like you know, there are more relevant things to say than just, you know, like broad strokes. Um, so Unity, audio, uh, like audio middleware such as Wise and Ephrod, that's not so bad. But again, you could just say audio implementation. Game engines, including Unity, Unreal Engine, Godot, uh, and no one really cares what DAWs you're using unless you're using Reaper, in which case, kudos to you for actually taking the plunge. It's great. Um, uh, but also at the same time, it's not really relevant to know what DAW you use. And uh, I also am an advocate of the fact that if you know how to use Unity, you pretty much know how to use Unreal. Like, uh, like maybe it works vice versa. I'm not really sure. And I'm I'm assuming if I applied for a job that was saying like you must know Godot skills, I could probably watch you know a week's worth of tutorials on YouTube and kind of get the picture. Um, I'm not trying to be cynical or or, or uh, demeaning about it, but what I'm saying is that all of these skills are relatively transferable. So. Instead of saying that, how about saying something like this? And this is tried and tested. I've used this um, like, uh, yeah, like it's it's pretty much in line with what my my elevator pitch is now. But how does this sound compared to the previous uh, pitch? I'm a sound designer with a broad range of skills specializing in sound design, audio implementation, programming, game design, and music composition. This isn't like like perfect, but it certainly worked for uh, for things that I've applied for. And to analyze it a little bit deeper, first and foremost, I'm a sound designer because I'm applying for a sound design position. I've got a broad range of skills, but I'm specializing or I'm specialized in sound design predominantly, obviously. If you want to know more, you can check out my CV, blah, 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 blah. Um, audio implementation, I'm assuming as an employer that you probably know either WISE or FMOD or both. Um, uh, and again, I'm personally a believer in that if you know one, you probably know how to do the other, like, because the ideas, the concepts are still the same. It wouldn't matter to me as an employer. Um, programming. Wow. Okay. Well, this person obviously knows how to, you know, like, uh, knows logic and problem solving skills, but also knows how to talk to programmers because that's a really important part of being a sound designer if you're doing technical stuff. Uh, and likewise with game design, you know, being able to understand, uh, uh, you know, putting the player first or the player experience first is really important. And then right at the end, music composition is clearly this isn't a uh, composer role. Um, yeah, like the, this isn't a composer role. So clearly I'm not going to put that at the top. It's great that you know music and this stuff really does feed into sound design. I very much appreciate when a sound designer has knowledge of um you know, knowledge of music theory and sort of like arrangement or instrumentation, or chances are, if you're a composer, you probably know how to do a bit of mixing as well. Uh, you know, like maybe even dynamic mixing if you do live stuff as well. So yeah, so it's really important, but it's not the most important when we're sort of like ordering our skills in a hierarchical order of first off what the uh, job application is asking for, but also at the same time, you know, like what the, um, what, the necessary skills for being a game sound designer actually is. So anyway, I feel like I'm getting angry at talking about this. I'm not angry by any means. Um, uh, I'm really excited. I'm pumped. So um, yeah, all right, cool. Uh, we have um, some examples now, uh, some wisdom and facts that we can learn from some, uh, some known successful, uh, I'm going to say generalized specialists here. Um, so some people that we know, let's take a look at Greg Lester, probably because we all know who he is, uh, for the most part. 
founder of uh, co-founder of Air, Air Wiggles and uh, and you know uh, founder of GameAudioLearning.com, and he also has Game Audio Analysis on YouTube. This is really cool. Um, so predominantly, he works as a sound designer. He works for Sound Cuts. That's you know fantastic. Um, and he's a really good sound designer as well. He's also a good technical sound designer, but, but he doesn't necessarily do that. Like, like that's not his focus. But as I said before, technical sound design very much like funnels into his work and it helps make him better at what he does. But you might not know that actually his first job in the industry, as far as I remember, he was actually working as a game designer. And I think he even learned a bit of C sharp. I remember chatting about it in the past, but, um, but yeah, so he worked as a game designer and also did a bunch of like biz dev stuff uh, for the, this micro indie that he was working for as well. Um, as I said before, educator, he's, he's very passionate about like education. And I would say that this, it's kind of a bit of a, a stretch, but his passion for education very much feeds into his sound design, in my opinion, because through doing things like teaching at ThinkSpace Education, which I do with him, um, or putting together game audio learning. I mean, we've all heard that like uh, the best way to learn is to teach. So um, so it's inevitable that a bunch of the the things that he's been teaching or things that he's learned while he's been teaching have sort of funneled into the way that he does sound design. I mean, he's doing like interviews with some of the best people in the industry. Like clearly he's learning a bunch and he's also making it available for all of us as well, which is, um, yeah, like really awesome. Uh, entrepreneur, he's really, you know, he's really business minded and that's really cool. He founded, co-founded Air Wiggles with uh, Lewis Thompson, which is uh, like bloody awesome. None of us would really be here right now if it weren't for them. Um, and also those things also funnel into sound design in ways that, uh, in, in ways that we may not even imagine, that he may not even imagine. And likewise with, uh, with his YouTube channel as well, doing game audio analyses are um, like his videos and stuff like that inevitably taught him like he, he did some like uh really cool sort of like redesigns using only like a tin can uh for making like the the bfg and doom um yeah so that that's really cool but also doing a bunch of the um uh the show reel reviews which uh has been really cool to see people's progress and stuff like that but also being able to talk to people in a way that they understand is uh is inevitably going to feed back into his sound design and see that oh these people are actually doing this in a way that i'm not particularly keen on or they are doing this in a way that like i'm really impressed by and i'm going to start applying that to my uh to my sound design so the point is he's a generalized specialist he has a bunch of fields and also he has a bunch of like other life experiences as well um that all feed into the way that he does sound design so let's take a look at someone else that we probably also know uh, Koji Kondo, uh, famous composer uh, of uh, Nintendo and made uh, some of the most recognizable theme tunes uh, and, and uh, music from, uh, you know, from our and previous generations. Um, he's also a pianist, and I'm sure that he also probably like plays a bunch of other instruments as well, but is too modest to say so. Um, He's also, you know, his his uh, online presence dictates that he's a sound designer and he very much is, you know, um, he's also a sound director and a music director. And while these things sound like, you know, oh, they're, they're all like sound related, but these jobs are all like very much uh, their own, you know, their own fields. So um, he also has this beautiful quote that's use whatever is at your disposal uh, to create new ideas and come up with stuff that's fresh and new. Uh, I mean, some of the stuff that he came up with for Ocarina of Time was insane because he was just going into like a CD shop and picking out like weird stuff. They even got into trouble for having like a Muslim uh, like chant that said Allah or something in um, uh, in their music. And they had to sort of like in the Japanese version, they had to change it for the uh, uh, for the like the Western version. Um, so really, really interesting stuff. But the point is that despite these fields being very sort of interlinked, they are, you know, inherently going to feed into one another. And I think the perfect example of this is how the, um, the sound design of Nintendo games is actually really tonal. Like it's really musical and, uh, and really playful and really sort of like, like, again, just, just really inspired by music whether it's just like the bapping of a coin or, you know, the, the bunch of other stuff where like 
the electric wire that uh, Lewis did a video on recently that was like the in Mario Odyssey when you're on the electric wire it sort of like harmonizes arpeggios with the the part of the tune that you're in it's insane check it out it's really really cool um so yeah so here's another quote from another air wiggler Johan England uh who on a post that I did about masterful storytelling uh Marshall McGee video that I reposted uh again check that out um yeah so Johan said learning from a range of uh Learning from a range of fields will broaden your understanding of the craft you do. Specialization is strength, but narrowness is not. And again, like it, it just kind of hit me when I was reading that. I was like, damn, this is like frame this shit. Like it's really cool. Um, but yeah, he's absolutely right. This idea of like a jack of all trades being uh, being something negative is just, you know, like absolutely not applicable anymore. If it even ever was, I don't know. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make here and the point that Johan's trying to make as well is that like, you know, maybe you can spread yourself too thin, but I don't think there's ever an experience that you have, regardless of whether it's negative or positive, that it won't sort of influence you in all aspects of your life. As I said before, it makes you who you are. Um, so here's a quote that I came, um, uh, yeah, found on the internet. I've linked the source below. There's this idea of a polymath, and that's essentially a, a generalized specialist. But this quote is, most creative breakthroughs come via making atypical combinations of skills. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's a really interesting concept because I like this idea that, um, you know, like uh, I'm a big believer in like, like creative limitations. Um, so say, for example, like we've all heard this idea of like, you know, the blank canvas. If we had an infinitely v like like vast canvas and like infinite choice of every uh like every me like painting medium that we could use or or whatever, like we would like we would find it very hard to actually be able to come up with something. So in that instance, we'd probably just default to whatever the like whatever you're used to doing like you kind of look at it and go oh well i've kind of painted fruit before so i guess i'll use oil paints and paint oil paint fruit whatever uh using like the same kind of size that you use however um a perfect example of this is uh, i have a few friends who do like like nail art which is really really cool when you when you look at it because first off it's a tiny canvas you also have like well collective 20 nails on your body, hopefully, um, or, you know, whatever, I can't think of the, <laughs> the right way of putting it. But um, the idea is that, you know, like, like the, cr the creative constraints of doing this with like acrylic as well um, is, yeah, like, it's really interesting. It's a tiny canvas, uh, you know, you have like, everyone's nails are like slightly different as well. But like, I've seen people come up with these sort of like arrays of uh, like, fruit themed nails or like game themed nails or uh, uh my girlfriend was saying something about like rock uh the the lady who won the eurovision having like rock acrylic nails like little rocks on them and stuff which is mad and it you know like like the idea of taking like your know, rocks and putting them on a nail is just absurd to me so anyway i digress um this idea is uh you know tried and uh, and proven by a bunch of people throughout history. Let's take an example of uh, some a band that's you know somewhat music related. So you've probably all heard of the band Queen, not the late Queen, uh, Queen the band. Um, they formed while studying at Cambridge University. They all had degrees in some fields. So Med Freddie Mercury had a degree in graphic design and illustration, Brian May in physics and did work in astronomy. Roger Taylor did a degree in biology and John Deacon in electronics. So what's interesting is the fact that they, they weren't even like pursuing music, although I'm pretty sure that they, they probably leapt on the opportunity when they, they, you know, when they found that they had something really good, but um, you know, they, they kind of like, they had, almost a, a plan A that didn't really work out because plan B was so good. But I think it's uh, like, you can't argue against the fact that like these skills that they had inevitably sort of funneled into their, uh, into their music, you know, whether it's just the sort of like experimentation kind of mentality 
uh, that scientists would approach music to. Um, they sort of brought that into the studio and sort of like came up with different ideas. I'm not necessarily saying that they're talking about like physics and stuff like that in their music, although some, you know, some songs are, but um, I would say that the, the sort of like atypical combination of putting scientists and music together kind of really worked out really well for them. So uh, yeah, some other examples include uh, Steve Jobs, who famously uh, combined design with technology to, uh, to create Apple. And it wasn't necessarily something that people really thought about. I mean, you look at like IBM laptops and stuff like that, and they're like, they're fuck ugly. Um, but like you look at Apple and it's something that you could probably put like on a mantelpiece, say what you want about Apple. But I, I would even say that it like, it, it comes down or like it sort of filtered down even to like the price is that like, this is a luxury item that, uh, that you're buying. And, uh, you know, it's going to be polished and really like fine tuned and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting combination that no one really did before. And it was successful. Mary Curie, uh, you might've heard of her. Um, she famously combined physics and chemistry and pioneered research on radiation. She became the first woman to win a Nobel prize, first person and only woman to win a Nobel prize twice and only person to win the Nobel prize in two different scientific fields, which is just, wow. Like, uh, yeah, really, really interesting. But you know, this, this sort of idea of like physics and chemistry com combining together and, and, you know, sort of, I mean, she was crazy to kind of like, like do what she did, but, uh, she did it and she was like massively successful. And then Hypatia, uh, combined philosophy, astronomy, and was arguably the first female mathematician in Alexandria, uh, Egypt. So, um, yeah, and, you know, these things that she did and she studied and, and uh, sort of uh, like, like her, the things that she studied, um, you know, we still talk about them today, which is bloody impressive for, you know, like, like, I can't remember what it is, maybe like nearly 2000 years or, or something. But yeah, it's, it's really, really cool. And uh, I think this idea of combining atypical skills is clearly like one way that you can find a niche for yourself and hopefully innovate something new. So uh, the, the last one that we have is a quote from Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, uh, he's probably arguably the person that everyone thinks about when you think of like the word polymath or, or whatever, because he was just, <laughs> he, he certainly had too many hobbies. So he says, study the science of art, study the art of science, develop your senses, especially learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. And he's absolutely right. Like, uh, it, like I said before, whether you like it or not, things and experiences and knowledge all filter through to all aspects of your life, <clears throat> go to therapy uh, and you will, <laughs> you will learn this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's worth stopping and thinking about. So as promised, uh, here is some homework. Uh, yeah, so some stuff that you can do to sort of uh, take these ideas and help yourself in your career or your life or your work, um, you know, even if it's just like your workflow and stuff. So think about a bottleneck in any of these things. Ask yourself, is there some skill or knowledge that could solve or alleviate it? Um, do you know anyone who you could ask to demystify it? We're on air wiggles for Christ's sake, like, like ask people and the number of people like uh, Juan Uribe has uh, said, reach out to him, even though he's not on social media anymore, find his email, watch that talk, uh, or like any of the other people, like I'm pretty sure anyone doing the AMAs and, and that, like Ash Reed and that are, are all super happy to talk about these things. Even if it's a, hey, I'd really appreciate some time, uh, like, like just talking to you for like half an hour. I've done it, this is where I'm at, uh, or how I got to where I'm at, um, and, you know, like, like, would you be able to explain this thing to me? I can't really find any information about it. Or could you point me to resources? Then research how to go about developing that skill. Like I said before, YouTube, asking your peers, mentors, check out the uh, Game Audio Learning mentor page. Like there are plenty of people out there, even past the vast number of people who are like, uh, who are on there, who are willing to share their knowledge and share their time to help other folks have the opportunities that you know, either they had or, or, you know, they didn't have, uh, and also books. There are some crazy good, like game audio books coming out at the moment that are, are very worth your time and money. Um, but also I would urge people to, to maybe think of like a free version, especially if you're like, uh, 
um, a student or someone, you know, like, like from a poorer background, like there are so many free resources out there. I could probably 99% like certain say that all of the knowledge that I got today is pretty much free. I, all of the Bracky's tutorials on YouTube and all of the like Marshall McGee videos and game audio analysis videos that I, I watched to get to where I am. I mean, like, like Noah, I think what's his name? Noah Citrin is also like really, really, he's doing some really, really cool stuff on YouTube. And I really highly recommend checking it out. Then plan how much time you could dedicate each week or day or year or whatever to learning it. Um, you know, there's loads of scientific evidence that says if you do a bunch of work um like at the uh like in one big chunk and then don't do anything for ages you're not really going to make much progress however if you dedicate a little bit of time even if it's just 10 to 20 minutes every day just make one sound a day you know and you'll notice first off you'll have like like a reference point to see how much you've developed but you'll notice after like like a week a month a year that actually, you know, uh, your your skills will will be improving a lot. Like I have videos from like seven years ago of the first time before I even knew I wanted to get into sound design when I did this like Final Fantasy X uh, uh, like like music and sound redesign. That I look at it now and I cringe, but I'm also able to look at it and see like, oh, these are actually some really cool ideas to uh, to learn from. And then goes without saying, put your plan into action like do this for everything. It's kind of like a tried and tested method. You kind of just need to, you need to be aware of something that's, uh, that's not going right. You need to check out how you could, uh, you know, how you could solve that problem. And then uh, just use everything at your disposal, being nice and not being a dick as we've probably learned in all of these talks. Um, and and try to try to demystify these things and try to learn as much as you can from everything. So anyway, that kind of like wraps up my talk. Uh, uh, just last little ending statements. Go out there, be the best generalist you can be. Be open to new experiences. Be curious. Make mistakes. Fail forwards, upwards, whichever direction. Just don't like go back constantly. Ask questions, but don't forget to have fun. Because if we weren't doing this to have fun then uh you know we'd be working in a bank or we'd be you know like i don't know we'd be in a rainforest somewhere who knows no matter how hard things get the journey and the lessons along the way will be worth it in the end they are ultimately what make you who you are so has anyone got any questions i promised uh that i would do this and i will uh, i will stop sharing the screen So first one, how do you divide up the time to learn and develop? Oh, it's going away. Other skills along with your primary area. Also, would it be better to do a little bit of each daily or dedicate certain thing, certain days to certain skills? Well, wow, the, these, these things keep on going. So it's an interesting question. I would say that at different points in my life, I've de like spent more energy in certain areas that I kind of like care about. Um, like I said before, I, I, I or might have said before, I was like a like a uh, live musician playing guitar, and um, uh, yeah, like like I I spent a lot of time playing guitar, and then suddenly one day I was like, oh, I actually want to make games, so I just focus like all of my energy on games. I think follow follow the fun or like follow what feels right um because uh because i don't think there's like any uh like like any rule book as to what you should do um but i think that if if you've got like a very clear goal i would say do things like like say you want to learn a bit of like wise or something spend maybe like like one hour or like half an hour every evening just watching like wise tutorials or like spending some time like doing uh doing some work within wise make your like little project i think it was uh aaron uh on air wiggles who who recently did a like like skateboarding thing in wise and uh you know he didn't have a game to do it with but he just did it all in wise and that just got like shown on on some wise stream which is really cool um so yeah are there any other questions 
uh, what am I working on uh, or developing right now, if anything? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, always developing sound design stuff. I'm always like uh, watching videos and uh, doing random bits, but not really like spending time like after work. Um, the one thing that I'm doing at the moment is uh, I'm really looking forward to the day that I can sort of start my own game studio. Uh, and uh, I'd really love to be working on my own game. So any time that I have, I'll spend like a, a, some holiday or some uh, like like a day or two working on this game that I'm working on that I will probably show you at the pub if you know me. And um, yeah, so so I guess it's just kind of like generalist game design stuff that I'm working on um but yeah but at the same time then i'm also sort of like lying in bed watching uh like noah citron videos or um or checking out air wiggles and seeing like other people's like uh, uh show reels on the real reviews and stuff like that or whatever so um so yeah constantly learning but not burning myself out that's like the really important thing is like not not getting to the point where i'm like oh not another day of sound design like i'm trying to keep it fresh every time or like every day um yeah so so don't burn yourself out there are a bunch of talks on burnout uh whether it's like free gdc ones or or whatever i highly recommend them uh, another question from adam uh have you ever come across an audio feature that you really want to include in your games but that you you're not sure how at least implementation wise oh my god <laughs> like everything uh i have a perfect example that i can't really talk about but I'm currently, uh, oh no, I, I can talk about a different one. Um, on a previous game, uh, we were making a mobile racing game uh, that has split screen and online multiplayer. And uh, it was only using um, uh, like stock Unity audio, like no middleware. That was like a hard no. And this is the one that I ended up making like an F mod version. I had no idea how to like, like, do audio programming so i started chatting to my friend bogdan at media molecule and he sort of like told me about some like audio programming patterns and stuff he helped me sort of like make my own uh like like sort of middleware within unity and uh then it came to the point of like oh unity doesn't really support split screen audio so now i'm gonna have to like figure out how to do this and uh yeah it it, it it's hard I genuinely believe that if if you put a little bit of effort into something like every day and you think about it and and like like I constantly think about stuff when I'm going for a walk or um like when I'm in the shower involuntarily um and and then like I'll be in the shower and I'm just sort of like oh my god it's just come to me the 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 way that I need to do this is this other thing but I'll also be like chatting to friends about it I chat to Greg very regularly about these ideas I chatted to um Ash Reed recently about like uh, some problems that I'm trying to overcome at the moment, even chatting to like FMOD because we're using FMOD uh, currently. And um, yeah, just sort of like chatting to them and trying to understand how their, <laughs> how their bloody system works, which is, it's really good. It's really cool, but I don't think a lot of people are like necessarily doing the stuff that, um, that I'm trying to do. So I think that regardless of what game you're making or, or what project you're working on, there's there's a high possibility that you're going to be like breaking ground at some point, or you're, you're going to be trying to do something, uh, something new, um, that there might not be resources online that can help you with that. So, um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Does anyone have any other questions potentially? Ho, ho, ho. Kelleher talk. I love it. If you can pronounce my name, well, I've said it now, but uh, if you can pronounce my name at the pub, then uh, you might get a pint, no promises. Uh, all right, cool. Mike asks, what is a good way to have your website show off yourself as a generalist? Do you focus on your primary skill area? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you can take a look at my website. I'll just write this out. Uh, uh, Sound.com. Um, yeah, if you take a look at my website, I've it's like seven or eight years of of iteration and I've spent far too much time procrastinating uh, doing like website design. But I'd say that ultimately I landed on the fact that um, the way that I'm going to make it in this industry is by being a, uh, a sound designer because I care. Uh, I don't care if someone tells me that like sound design, my sound design doesn't sound right. I can just change that. But if someone tells me that my music doesn't sound right, I take it like as a personal offense. Um, 
I've, I've got better at that like now, but I think that it's um, like, it's really helped me to kind of just like focus on one area as a specialist um, where that's like my main point of focus. But I think that all of the other aspects that I mentioned before, I think, uh, in fact, I could probably just, uh, I could probably just get this up here and, and give you like my, um, my like big opening statement. Uh, uh, hello, I'm John. I'm a Swedish Irish audio designer from Spain, working predominantly in the video game industry. Over the past seven years, I have designed and directed audio for games from conception to release on a wide array of, a wide array of platforms. Say that time, five times. Integrating closely with the de uh, develop development teams to help them achieve and elevate their creative and technical visions. Creative and technical being like the uh, the like key points. Uh, my expertise lies in a combination of sound design, audio implementation, and music composition. And with additional skills in programming and game design, I am able to effectively bridge these various fields to create exceptional inter interactive audio experiences. Holy crap, I, I must have been drunk when I was writing that because that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I think marketing, marketing yourself, like I said in the slide before, is very much like um, don't don't make your elevator pitch too broad very much like like focus it on the thing that you're applying for even if you in, in one position you're applying for a like a composer position and in another position you're applying for like a game designer position like like have two show reels or have two sort of like cover letters or cvs to uh to sort of like send to the relevant people and talk to people that way because um, you know, not everyone's fortunate enough or has enough time to make uh, to make uh, show reels that are like like diverse enough to be able to go like, oh, this is a horror game company, so all of my um, all of my you know elements or videos in this show reel are going to be horror. Um, but I think that if you have the possibility of doing anything like that, then you should very much like focus it as much as you can. Another really good bit of advice for uh, for people working on portfolios is don't work on stuff uh, that you wouldn't want to work on yourself. Like I think that it's very it's a lot easier to to let the creative juices flow when you're actually working on something that you give a crap about. So um, so yeah, like I think I probably need to tailor my um, my portfolio a little bit less towards the AAA sphere and more towards the like cute Nintendo kind of like uh, like Zelda Splatoon realm, because that's what I really care about. And that's what I like really enjoy doing. And I'm really lucky to be able to do kind of stuff like that, like enough stuff that I, I'm sort of like happy to do that um, in uh, in my day job working on Human Fall Flat to So um, so, yeah, it's really cool. And yeah, Adam, I did uh, I did design my website myself. Um, I didn't get any help really, but if you class help as um, checking out a bunch of other people's websites, I pretty much just had this problem of like looking at someone's website and then being like, all right, I want that website. And then I'd like try to miserably fail at uh, making it myself. Um, and then, um, then yeah, then I'd look at someone else's and then I'd like take elements that I liked from there. And then it kind of like, like it might look cool. I can't see it objectively anymore. But to me, it's this sort of like Frankenstein's monster of uh, of like all the elements that I liked from something else. And I'd probably say that my sound design is the same as well. Um, that my sound design is is this sort of like mishmash of all of, all, you know, all of the sound design that I've really liked in the past or that I've sort of like referenced um uh, uh throughout the years and um no one else is ever going to notice that because they haven't had the same experiences that you have um but i'm pretty sure you know like like every com every famous composer is derivative of another famous composer from from before their time i i genuinely think that um i think that people accuse han zimmer of being derivative of of um uh, holst I, you know, like, I, I think that, oh, no, is it Holst? No, I think it's like, like, Helga or someone? I don't know. I think it's John Williams that they accuse of, of being, um, being derivative of Holst, you know, the, the sort of like Star Wars sounding like Mars and, um, all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, but I, I think that that's not a problem is, is there's a saying of like, you know, uh, uh, uh was it working on the shoulders of, standing on the shoulders of giants um it's it's really 
you know, really important to to enjoy the things that you enjoy and then sort of like funnel that into your work. So, wow, I've I've really digressed. Does anyone have any other questions? Cool. I'm just having a look at the chat in case I missed anything. Um, Cool. If there aren't any other questions, then um, yeah, I'm very happy to to. Well, I'm very grateful that everyone showed up on a uh, Friday evening for me. Probably morning for other people. Maybe midnight for other people. If you're like really hardcore, um, I hope that everyone's like really enjoying AirCon. And uh, for any newcomers to Air Wiggles, you know, like I hope you're enjoying it here too. I hope that this space like really grows. Uh, like, like even more than it has already. We already have like thousands of members. Um, but yeah, it's it's such an honor to be part of the game audio community. I have a lot of friends in art and stuff who are just like, I, I'm envious. So revel in that, like, you know, like make the most of uh, the kick-ass community that we have here. And, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions, any follow-up questions or, um, you know, any um, like, yeah, like anything, just reach out. The worst thing that happens is I'm too busy to to answer, but I'll get to it eventually. So um, so yeah, thank you everyone for interacting. Um, Bettina says just a comment on what you said. It's very hard when you design something that you really enjoy, especially music. And the uh, producer wants to change everything. I feel attacked in my soul. I have like hats off to anyone who who can do their job and does that. But I think it's something you know, like getting thick skin. Is something that's really um, like it comes with experience. Is uh, you know, and if you're not able to do that, then it will probably break you, and then you 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 know, you can always sort of like sidestep as well. So, right. Thanks everyone. Uh, have a great weekend, and yeah, hopefully catch you in some of the other uh, the other talks.